Our goal in this video is to talk about the structure of z mod n. So what, how does the arithmetic in z mod n behave? And maybe how is it different from the arithmetic in z? How is it different from the arithmetic of the integers? So first we'll recall some properties about z and we'll give them names, we'll recall their names. So the first property about the integers is that if I take any two integers and add them together, I produce another integer. So this is called closure under addition. The sum of two integers is an integer. So if I take some two things in z, and combine them with addition, I get another element of z. The second property that the integers satisfy is called associativity of addition, so that a plus parentheses b plus c is the same as parentheses a plus b plus c. Another property is that addition is commutative, so that a plus b is always the same as b plus a. Another property is that we have the special number called zero. Um, zero satisfies this nice property that any integer plus zero is that same integer. So a plus zero is equal to a, and zero plus a is equal to a. And finally, we know that for every integer a, there's an integer I can add to it to get zero. So we're, we're gonna say that a has an additive inverse, and we'll call z zero the additive identity. So for example, if I would take the integer three, three plus negative three is zero. So I always have a way of getting back to zero. So these are some of the important properties that the integers satisfy under addition. You might ask, well, what about multiplication? What properties does multiplication satisfy? And you might recall multiplication has some similar properties. So for example, we have closure under multiplication. If I take any two integers and multiply them, I produce another integer. So the product of two integers gives another element of Z we know that in that multiplication is associative, so that a times bc is the same as ab times c. I know that multiplication is commutative, so that a times b is always equal to b times a. I know that there's a special integer called one, such that a times one is equal to a, and one times a is equal to a, so we're gonna call one the multiplicative identity. And the integers have this rather nice property as well, that if I multiply any two integers a and b and I get zero, it has to be the case that either a was zero or b was zero. So we'll explore this property a little bit when we talk about rings, but this is, this is an important property that the integers satisfy. Finally, you might ask, okay, well, addition has its own set of properties, multiplication has, has its own set of properties. If I wanna talk about these properties together, I need to ask how do these two, or if I wanna talk about these two operations together, how do these two operations interact? Well. There, there's this thing called the distributive law, that a times b plus c is a times b plus a times c, and a plus b times c is a times c plus b times c. So this is the distributive laws, and this tells us how our two operations interact. Okay, so now we'll move on to z mod n and talk about, well, which properties of z does z mod n have as well? So we'll see that not all the properties listed here are gonna carry over to z mod n. So we'd like to explore which ones actually do. Okay, so a natural question to now ask is, which properties that Z satisfies does Z mod N satisfy? And it turns out the answer is almost all of them except for notably one property. So let's kind of go through the list of properties that Z mod N satisfies and we'll prove a few of them. I'll leave the rest as exercises because the proofs are all pretty similar to one another. So the first property is that if I take any two elements of z mod n and I add them together, I get another element of z mod n. And this just holds by definition, by the definition we, we used for the sum of two equivalence classes. The second is associativity. So we have this associativity of addition. The third property is commutativity of addition, that the equivalence class of a plus the equivalence class of b is the same as the equivalence class of b plus the equivalence class of a. Okay, uh, we have the existence of an additive identity so zero behaves how you expect it to, a plus zero is equal to a. And we have the existence of additive inverses. So if I take any element of z mod n, I can always add something to it to get me back to zero. Okay, so these are the properties that addition satisfied in z, and we see that in z mod n it satisfies these same properties. What about multiplication? Well, for multiplication, we know, by again, by definition, that if I take two equivalence classes in z mod n and I multiply them, I get a new equivalence class in z mod n. I know that uh, I'm going to show that, that multiplication is associative, so this property carries over. We have that multiplication is going to be commutative, so the equivalence class of a times the equivalence class of b is the same as the equivalence class of b times the equivalence class of a. We have the existence of a multiplicative identity, so a times one is equal to a. 
and we have distributive laws. So we, we've inherited, we're, we'll see that we've inherited all of our properties from Z except one. There was this property that said AB is equal to zero, implies A is equal to zero, or B is equal to zero. We'll see that Z mod N does not inherit that properly, or that property. Okay, so let's go through the proofs of some of these properties. So the first thing that I'll note, as I mentioned earlier, is that properties one and six just hold by definition, right? Just by how we've defined our operations, we're guaranteeing that the sum of two equivalence classes is, is an equivalence class and that the product of two equivalence classes is an equivalence class. So these two hold by definition. Let's prove property two. So we'll prove a few of these and then I'll leave the rest as exercises because they're all pretty similar to one another. So for property two, we'll start with A plus B plus C, and let's unravel this using our definition. So ideally what we want to do is we want to turn this into some statement about the integers after we unravel our definitions and then convert it back into our uh, a statement about uh, equivalence classes. Okay, so let's do that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this term in parentheses here and I'm going to add these two together. So what do I get? Well, this is just A plus the equivalence class of B plus C. Okay, so that's just the definition of addition of equivalence class. I'm taking the thing in parentheses and just combining it. Okay, so what do I have now? Now I'm going to take B plus C and add A to it. So I'm going to use the definition of addition again. So I have that this is A that's been added to B plus C. So there's our definition of addition. And then I might notice that what's going on inside these brackets, these are all integers. So A, B, and C are integers. So now I can use the fact that addition in the integers is associative, so I can move my parentheses. Right? I know that addition in Z is associative, so I'm going to move my parentheses. So this is associativity in Z. Once I've used this property, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take everything apart. Right? So the idea was to kind of use our definitions to put everything together, use a property about the integers, and now I'm going to pull everything apart again. So I'm going to use the definition of addition now to pull this apart. So this is saying do a plus b plus c. So I'm going to define. I'm going to pull this apart into a plus b plus c. That's the definition of addition of equivalence classes. And now I'm going to pull this apart as well. So I'm going to get that this is equal to the equivalence class of a plus the equivalence class of b plus the equivalence class of c. So we've proved property two. So again, the philosophy here is turn this into a problem about integers. Use the pro relevant property of the integers, and then rewrite the statement as something about equivalence classes. So we'll do this again for another one of these. Okay, so let's prove property four. So if I wanna do property four, the first thing I'm going to do is to say, okay, well, let's look at a plus zero. By definition of addition of equivalence classes, this is the equivalence class of a plus zero. And now we know that, well, inside we have an integer a plus an integer zero. We know that the integer zero is the additive identity. So a, the integer a plus the integer zero is just a. Right, so we're just using the fact that a plus zero is equal to a and z, and we've proved half of four. Right, that's it. It's just as simple as that. Let's prove the other half. Let's prove. Let's look at the equivalence class of zero plus the equivalence class of a. So we follow the same strategy. We use the definition of addition of equivalence classes. So this is the equivalence class of zero plus a, and now I know that in the integers, the integer zero plus the integer a is just going to be a. So there we have it, we've proved four. And the rest of them are all pretty straightforward, right? The idea is you combine everything into one equivalence class. So now you have a problem about integers, you use the relevant property of the integers, and then you pull everything uh, back into a statement about equivalence classes. So I'll leave the rest of these as exercises. Okay, now that we have some of our basic properties established, we'd like to analyze the structure of Z mod N a little bit more deeply. So let's look at z mod 5 and z mod 6 and specifically the interesting th the interesting thing to look at will be their multiplication tables so just as practice let's fill in the table for z mod 5 so we know 0 times any integer is 0 so 0 times 0 is 0 0 times 1 is 0 so on and so forth so these guys are all zeros and similar similarly 1 times 0 is 0 2 times 0 is 0 3 times 0 is 0 so on and so forth so these are easy to fill in we also know that the next row is pretty easy to fill in because one times any integer is that same integer. Right? So one times one is one, one times two is two, so on and so forth. So these are rather easy to fill in. Okay, so that's straightforward. Now let's look at some other parts of this table. So two times two is four, four is in our set Z mod five, so we'll write four. Three times two is going to be six, and six mod five is one. 
Right? So again, just as practice, we have 2 times 3 is equal to 6, and 6 is equal to 1 if I'm working modulo 5. All right, so I'm taking the remainder of 6 when I divide by 5. 2 times 4 is 8. I see that 8 is not in my set, so when I do 2 times 4, I have to take its remainder when I divide by 5. So its remainder is 3. So I see that 2 times 4 is equal to 3 in this set. 3 times 2, our next, our next entry in our table, 3 times 2 we already said that's 6. It's the same as 2 times 3. 3 times 3 is 9, so the next entry is 9. And 9, when I divide by 5, its remainder is 4. So I put a 4 over here. And the next entry is 3 times 4, so 3 times 4 is 12. And 12, when I divide by 5, its remainder is 2. So 3 times 4 in this set is equal to 2. OK, so far so good. And let's look at the last row. I have to do 4 times 2. 4 times 2 is equal to 8. We already saw that 8 was 3, so 4 times 2 is 3. 4 times 3 is 12. We've already seen that 12 is equal to 2, so 4 times 3 is 2. And finally, 4 times 4, we haven't seen this occur yet. This is 16, and 16 has a remainder of 1 when I divide by 5. So I have 4 times 4 is equal to 1 in this set. So I filled in my multiplication table, and in particular, I want to draw your attention to this corner of the multiplication table. So pay attention to this. So we're, we're going to see in a second that Z mod 6 behaves kind of differently, and we're going to kind of want to notice what are some of the differences that we see. Okay, so for Z mod 6, we could do something similar. The first row is all zeros. The first column is all zeros, because again, this is just multiplication by zero. The second row is also straightforward. 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 2 is 2, so on and so forth. And the second column here is also straightforward. 2 times 1 is 2, 3 times 1 is 3, 4 times 1 is 4, 5 times 1 is 5. Okay, so that's multiplication by 0, multiplication by 1. Now, let's look at our, our entries here. So 2 times 2 is going to be 4, so we'll just write 4. Okay, but what about 2 times 3? What about this entry right here? Well, if I look at Z mod 6, 2 times 3... This is equal to 6, and 6 has a remainder of 0 when I, when I divide by 6. So the thing that I notice here is that 2 times 3 is equal to 0. Okay, that's interesting because 2 is not 0, 3 is not 0, but they multiply to 0. That's something we haven't really encountered with the integers. So this is one, one thing we're noticing that Z mod 6 might behave a little bit differently. Okay, let's keep going. We have the next entry is 2 times 4. 2 times 4 is 8. And 8, when I divide by 6, gives me a remainder of 2, so I write 2 times 4 is 2. And then finally, I have 2 times 5. This is going to be 10. 10, when I divide by 6, gives me a remainder of 4, so I have 4. So a few things to notice here. Uh, 2 times 3 gives me 0. That's kind of weird, because 2 is not 0 and 3 is not 0. And we might notice that certain numbers repeat. So we have this kind of cyclical pattern occurring here. Whereas if we look at Z mod 5, we don't have these kinds of cyclical patterns anywhere. We just see every number occurs exactly once. Okay, so let's continue filling in our table and see what else happens. Well, 3 times 2, the next entry, we already know that that's 0. 3 times 2 is 0. What about 3 times 3? 3 times 3 is 9. When I divide by 6, I get 3. Okay. 3 times 4, the next entry, that's 12. When I divide by 6, I get a remainder of 0. So 3 times 4 is 0, and 3 times 5, I know that this is 15. When I, when I divide by 6, I get a remainder of 3. Okay, so we see that this, is, this has some very different behavior compared to Z mod 5. We're already seeing some very different behavior. Namely, we're seeing these kind of like cyclical patterns occurring. We see that there's a 0, 3, 0, 3, 0, 3. There's a 0, 2, 4, 0, 2, 4. And Z mod 5 didn't have any of this. Okay, let's continue filling in our table. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 divided by 6 leaves a remainder of 2. 4 times 3 is 12. Well, so let's write this out. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 is equal to 6. 4 times 3 is 12. When I divide by 6, I get a remainder of 0. 4 times 4 is 16. When I, when I divide by 6, I get a remainder of 4. And 4 times 5 is equal to 20. When I divide by 6, I'm left with a remainder of 2. Okay, so they put a 2 here. And now let's look at 5. So 5 times 2 is 10. And when I divide by 6, I get a remainder of 4. So I get a 4 over here. 5 times 3 is 15. When I divide by 6, I get a remainder of 3. 5 times 4 is 20. When I divide by 6, I get a remainder of 2. 
and 5 times 5 is 25. When I divide by 6, I get a remainder of 1. Okay, so we filled in our multiplication table, and now we're going to want to try to look for some properties. We, we can do this for z mod any n, but z mod 5 and z mod 6 are, are good examples. So one thing we might notice is, okay, well, 2, 3, and 4 have some interesting stuff going on. Namely, I can take 2 times something that's non-zero, so I could take 2 times some non-zero number and get 0, right? Namely, 2 times 3 give me 0. Okay, I could take 3 times 2 and get 0. I might also notice that 3 times 4 gives me 0. So 3 times a non-zero entry will also give me 0. Similarly with 4, I could take 4, let's say 4 times 3, and I can produce 0. Right? So I might notice that 2, 3, and 4 behave one way. I cannot do this with 5. There's no number I can multiply 5 against besides 0 to give me 0. Right? 5 times 1 is 5, 5 times, five times 2 is 4, 5 times 3 is 3, 5 times 4 is 2, and 5 times 5 is 1. So 5 doesn't have this property. So one thing you might notice is that 2, 3, and 4 are not, rel not relatively primed to 6. They share a common divisor with 6, and this might be what's leading to this behavior. 5, on the other hand, is relatively primed to 6. The GCD of 5 and 6 is 1, and I get another kind of behavior. Okay. And the other thing I might notice on this side is, well, 1, 2, and 3, and 4, for that matter, are relatively primed to 5. And I have a similar behavior here that I do for 5 down here, right? Namely, if I look at 2, there's nothing I can multiply 2 against to give me 0. There's nothing I can multiply 3 against to give me 0. There's nothing I can multiply 4 against to give me 0. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing that's non-zero. Right? I could always multiply something by 0 to get 0. So I might have this question of, well, it looks like z mod 5 is behaving a lot differently than z mod 6. Um, z mod 5 has some nice behavior. Does this have anything to do with 5 being a prime? The answer is going to be yes, as we'll see in a second. Um, z mod 6 has some elements that behave quote-unquote nicely and some don't. Um, and the ones that behave kind of strangely are the ones that are not relatively primed to six. Right? So we're going to summarize this in a theorem. We're gonna try to try to capture all of this behavior in, in two theorems actually. So we'll do that now. Okay, so we're ready to prove our first theorem. And the one thing you would notice if we write out a bunch of these tables is that Z mod P for P prime behaves pretty differently from Z mod N when when n is not prime. So for example, if we write a table for z7 or z11, we'll be able to confirm certain behaviors, and this theorem will tell us what behaviors we'd be able to confirm. So the theorem says the following. It says, let p be an integer, and p be bigger than 1. So the following are going to be equivalent. So the following are logically equivalent. 1, p is prime. 2, if I take any equivalence class in z mod p, that's non-zero, then I can solve the equation a times x is equal to 1. So this is telling me that every non-zero element in z mod p has a multiplicative inverse. 3. Whenever b times c are in z mod p and b times c is equal to 0, then b is equal to 0 or c is equal to 0. So this is that special property that we said the integers have, but we left out when we were talking about properties of z mod n. It turns out that z mod p, when p is prime, is going to be the only instance where this property still holds. Okay, so just a quick note on what I mean by the following are equivalent. I just mean that one is true if and only if two is true, if and only if three is true. So this is how we're going to proceed. We're going to show one if and only if two, if and only if three is true. So th that's what logical equivalence there is. And I'm going to show this in the following way. I'm going to show that one implies two, two, implies 3, and 3 implies 1. So that'll allow us to get from any one of these to any other one of these. Okay, so let's begin our proof, and we'll start with the proof that 1 implies 2. So let's start. I'll say, suppose p is prime. And what do I want to do? I want to show that if a is any non-zero element of z mod p, then I can solve this equation. Right, I'd like to show that a times x equals to 1 always has a solution, I have to assume that a is non-zero. So I'm going to take a non-zero element of z mod p. I'll say let a be a non-zero equivalence class in z mod p. And the first thing we want to do is convert this to a statement about mods. Right? So this is the same as saying that a is not congruent to 0 mod p. Right? So using our properties of 
what a congruent to b mod n means and using our properties of equivalence classes we can write this well what does this tell me this says that then p does not divide a minus zero in other words p does not divide a okay so we know that a is not a multiple of p how does that help us well let's look at the gcd of a and p we also know that the gcd of any integer and a prime is equal to one or it's equal to the prime itself. But since p doesn't divide a, we know that the GCD of a and p is not equal to p. So hence, I'm forced to say that the GCD of a and p has to be 1. All right, it's my only option. Otherwise, p divides a. So what does this tell me? Well, if I know the GCD of a and p is 1, I can use Bezu's lemma and say, then, there exist integers u and v such that a u plus p v is equal to 1. Okay. Let's rewrite this equation. So then I can say a u minus 1 is equal to p times negative v if I rewrite this equation. And so a u is congruent to 1 mod p. Right, so again, this is now since p divides a u minus 1. Well, if I take this statement that a u is congruent to 1 mod p and now write it in terms of equivalence classes, well, this just says that the equivalence class of a times the equivalence class of u is equal to the equivalence class of 1, and I've produced a solution to my equation. Right? I take x is equal to u, and I've produced the, a solution to the equation ax is equal to 1. Okay, so we've shown that 1 implies 2. Okay, so now we need to show that 2 implies 3. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two equivalence classes in z mod p and assume that they, their product equals 0. So I'll say let b and c be elements of z mod p and suppose that b times c is equal to 0. Okay, so what I'd like to conclude is that either the equivalence class of B is equal to zero or the equivalence class of C is equal to zero. So let's see how we can go about this. Well, we have two things to consider. If the equivalence class of B is equal to zero, then we're done, All right? There's nothing to do, we're done. So suppose that the equivalence class of B is non-zero. I'd like to then show that the equivalence class of C is forced to be zero. So let's do that. Well. Since we're assuming 2, I can say that there exists some x in z mod p such that b times x is equal to 1, right? So I know, I'm, what does 2 say? 2 says if I take a non-zero element, I could always multiply it by something to get 1, and that's what we're assuming. We're assuming that 2 is true. Okay, this can be rewritten, since we know our multiplication is commutative, as x times b is equal to 1. Okay, so let's use this in our equation up here. So we have that b times c is equal to 0 and x times b is equal to 1. Well, let's, let's see what happens when we combine these two. So we have that b times c is equal to 0. I'm going to multiply both sides by x on the left. So this gives me that x times b times c is equal to x times 0. And what does this tell me? Well, I know x times b is equal to 1, so this is going to be 1 times c is equal to x times 0, which is 0. And this implies now that c is equal to 0. And we've shown that property 3 holds. Right? If b is non-zero, we've shown that c is forced to be 0. Okay, so now we're ready to prove that 3 implies 1, and this is going to use a property of prime numbers that we proved earlier. So I'm going to suppose that z mod, pre, z mod p has the property that whenever b times c is equal to 0, then b is equal to 0 or c is equal to 0. So let's reformulate this in terms of mod. So we'll say, well, this is the same as saying that bc is congruent to 0 mod p implies that either b is congruent to 0 mod p or c is congruent to 0 mod p. 
Okay, that's, a, that's an equivalent formulation of that property. And what's another way to write this? This is the same as saying, well, IE, P divides BC minus zero, so we'll omit, we'll omit the minus zero. This implies that P divides B or P divides C. Well, by an earlier result, so by a result from earlier, this is equivalent to P being prime. So this is equivalent to P being prime. Okay, so now we've shown that P must be prime if Z mod P has this property. Okay, so we've proved our theorem here. All right, so we're ready to prove our last result. So the theorem is gonna say the following. It's gonna say A times X is equal to one has a solution if and only if the GCD of A and N is one. So now we're not saying anything about primes. N can be any positive integer. So what is this theorem actually saying? It's saying that the only equivalence classes, the only A's in Z mod N that have a multiplicative inverse are the ones that are relatively prime to n. So we saw this behavior when we were looking at z mod 6. The only two numbers in z mod 6 that could be multiplied by another number in z mod 6 were 1 and 5, right? 1 times 1 is equal to 1, and 5 times 5 is 25, which is, con which is equal to 1 mod 6. So the only two numbers that I could multiply by something to get 1 back are 1 and 5. We saw that 2, 3, and 4 did not have this behavior. And again, this is because 2 and 6 are not relatively prime, 3 and 6 are not relatively prime, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's confirm this. Okay, so let's start our proof. We'll first prove the forward direction. So I'll suppose that we have a solution. So suppose that A times W is equal to 1 for some equivalence class W in Z mod N. Okay, so let's rewrite this. This is just saying IE, the equivalence class of AW, is equal to the equivalence class of one. And now let's convert this to a statement about mods. Well, in other words, this is saying that AW is congruent to one mod N. So the point is that this right here is equivalent to this statement. Okay, so there exists, so first, I guess before you say that, we say that n divides aw minus one, and so there exists some integer j and z such that aw minus one is equal to n times j, or in other words, I'm going to write this equation in the following way. I'm going to say that this says a times w plus n times negative j is equal to one. So I've written one as a linear combination of a and n. The claim that I'm going to make is that the GCD of A and N is equal to 1. So let's prove this. I'll say let D be the GCD of A and N. Well, then D divides A and D divides N. So that's by definition of GCD. So there exists integers. Let's call them, well, let's not use X. Let's call them Y and Z such that a is equal to d times y and n is equal to d times z. Okay, so let's rewrite our equation that we have. We have one is equal to, well, this was a w plus n times negative j. I can now write this as, I'm gonna replace the a and I'm gonna replace the n. So I'm gonna get dyw plus dz times negative j. And what does this give me? This is just d times some integer. The integer is yw plus z times negative j. And in particular, this tells me that d has to divide one, which implies that, well, what are the divisors of one? They're one and negative one, but the greatest common divisors are positive. So this tells me that the GCD is one. So I can conclude that the GCD of a and n must be one. Okay, so that takes care of the forward direction, and now we'll do the backwards direction. So the backwards direction is going to look similar to the proof of the previous theorem. So let's proceed with the backwards direction. I'll suppose that the GCD of A and N is equal to one. Well, by Bezu's lemma, we know that there exists integers. So there exists integers, let's say U and V, such that A times U plus N times V is equal to one. In other words, this tells me that a u minus one is equal to n times negative v. Well, in other words, n divides a u minus one. 
In other words, AU is congruent to 1 mod n. And in other words, if I can convert this to a statement about equivalence classes, it says A times U, the equivalence class of AU is the equivalence class of 1. And using our definition of multiplication, this is saying that A times U is equal to 1. And so X is equal to U solves A times X is equal to 1. And we've produced our solution. Okay, so we'll stop here.